Hello, and welcome to another episode of Conscious Business Connections, brought to you by the New York City Chapter of Conscious Capitalism. My name is Joe Larangero, and I'm joined today by Todd Churches. He's the co-founder of Big Blue Gumball, professor at NYU. He also lectures at Columbia University, and he's the author of the recently released book called Visual Leadership, Leveraging the Power of Visual Thinking in Leadership and in Life. Uh, quite a busy man. Todd, welcome to the program. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, to get us rolling, Todd, this notion of visual leadership is probably a new concept to folks. Um, how did you first develop this, this model? Um, well, the concept of visual leadership, first of all, the word itself is spelled as a single word with a single shared capital L with the foundational concept being that um, who you are and how you lead is inseparable from your, the lens through which you see the world, right? So we all lead visually. We all have a vision of where we see ourselves in the future. So we're not talking about leadership with a capital L as in the vice president or the CEO, we're talking about every individual has a vision. With, with, where do you want, what do you wanna be doing a year from now, three years from now, five years from now? So um, visual leadership is all about how do you turn that vision into a reality through seeing the future and then making that future actually come true. So um, my background is in the TV industry and in the entertainment industry. So a lot of my work I do in management leadership consulting, training, and coaching is founded in, um, first of all, my years as a baby boomer growing up watching TV shows like Superman and Batman. Secondly, I was an English literature major with a concentration in Shakespeare and poetry. And then I worked for a number of years in the entertainment industry out in LA, uh, first in the advertising in New York for Ogilvy and Mather. And then I worked for a series of jobs, first for Michael Nesmith of the Monkees. Baby boomers know him. Millennials have no idea who I'm talking nope. about. Um, then I worked for Aaron Spelling in TV production when they were doing Dynasty. I worked in casting for Columbia Pictures Television, comedy at Disney, and drama at CBS before getting into the theme park business as a project manager. So my visual leadership concepts were basically an accumulation of all those years of seeing the world through the lens of media and entertainment, combined with um, an unfortunate uh, concurrence of uh, having some of the worst bosses who've ever set foot on this planet. So my book is dedicated first to my wife, <laughs> secondly to my parents, and thirdly to, to all the horrible bosses without whom none of this would be possible. So that's my in the background, how it all kind of came together in this big Venn diagram of uh, convergence. Yeah, you just gave me all nostalgia with the programs <laughs> you just mentioned. Uh, yeah. I, well, I just love how your career has taken these different trajectories and you live these multiple lives. Um, yeah, it's definitely one of the things I say to my students because I teach in the HR master's program at NYU is, you know, we talk about in HR, you know, having a career path. I said, it is, for most people, it's not a path. A path implies like stepping stones in a park through a garden. It's a roller coaster of ups and downs, twists and turns, exhilarating highs, terrifying plummets, right? And you just don't know what's around the corner, right? So that to me, my, that's, that's what my career was like anyway. So most people I know, I'm always interested to hear when I talk to business professionals, how did you end up doing what you're currently doing? Is it what you envisioned when you were in high school and college? And for like 90% of people, it's not. Unless you're like a doctor or a lawyer and then some kind of linear path leading to that. Most of us yeah. ended up in different places and using Robert Frost's home, the road not taken, we come to a fork in the road. And as Yogi Berra said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it, um, right? And so we go, to, we make a choice and we think, oh, we can always go. I, when I left television, which was my dream, I said, oh, I can always go back to television and never did because life took me down a whole other path leading to what I'm doing today. Yeah, I think the stat is less than 30% of folks and their career work in the same field that their major prepared them for. Yeah. Um, so we all, yeah, what I'm doing now, what you're doing now was, was unimaginable to us back then. And perhaps, you know, 10 years from now, we might be, we might be doing something unimaginable to us right now as life. Yeah, when you think about the future of work, what are the jobs that don't even exist yet Correct. that people will be doing? Yep. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, you mentioned the theme park experience, and uh, I guess this is really what propelled you with that vision. When you talk about visual le leadership, some people say, well, yeah, I know what vision is, and we create a vision for the company. That's not what you're talking about. You're actually talking about a, a actual creating imagery in your mind. How did that develop for you? I know that the theme park experience was part of that journey. Yeah. Um, so one aspect is, you know, visualization can work in a lot of, if you wake up in the morning and you had a dream, you say you pictured something in your mind's eye, you had a vision. Um, when you envision how your day is going to unfold, that's visual thinking. When you think about how you want your, what you want your future to look like, that's visual thinking, right? That's just one small component. The others are using visual imagery, mental models and frameworks, metaphor and analogy, and storytelling, which we could talk more about later. But the incident that uh, um, that, that really was 
you know, we talk about in our lives, we go through different episodes and we don't realize it in the moment that we're having a defining moment or a transformative moment until we connect the dots looking backwards, right? So um, I, when I left television, mainly my last job at, at, I won't say which TV network, I had the worst boss in the history of the world. I won't give away the network, but it had a C, a B, and an S in its name. Um, <laughs> so I had this horrible boss and one of the chapters in my book, I talk about it. I was sitting at my desk typing and I felt something whipped by my head and she threw about, had thrown a box of pens at me because they were the wrong ones. She wanted the fine point, these were the medium points. And I tell my students that story and I'm like, when we're talking about feedback, I'm like, is there any other way you might have given your assistant the feedback that they ordered the wrong pens? And I was like, nope, can't think of anything else. It's like, you know, throw it at their head. That's the only thing I could think of. So um, I, I finally said, you know, I can't do this anymore. And I left for a variety of reasons. And I took a job as a project coordinator for a theme park company through a friend of mine. And the project manager was moved on to another project. So all of a sudden, with no experience, no knowledge of anything, I got thrust into the role of project manager. Um, for a company that, that made theme park rides and attractions. And we were manufacturing these life-size robotic animal figures for a cultural theme park in Shenzhen, China, which is just over the border from Hong Kong. So one second, I'm the coordinator. Next minute, I'm the project manager. And it's like, oh, by the way, you have to oversee the whole project and you can have to go to China to oversee the installation. I was 30 years old, an extreme introvert, terrified of flying, didn't even have a passport, had never been out of the United States before. And all of a sudden they're shipping me off to Shenzhen, China to oversee this thing. So I get there with two crew people, an electrician and a mechanical guy, and we show up and no one speaks English. Even the translator that was assigned to us did not speak any English. So um, how did we communicate? We needed to, so long story short, I started drawing. I started picking a paper and sketching things out, like what goes where. So it was basically turned into a game of Pictionary and charades, right? It's like two words, sounds like screwdriver or tape measure. So I had to literally draw things out and um, we got it done through pictures and pointing basically. And then so on reflecting, I realized how using visual imagery to communicate an idea was so impactful, not only when you speak a different language, but even with people with whom you speak the same language. And one of my mantras is how do you get people to quote unquote, see what you're saying? How do you get an idea from your head and into someone else's? Shakespeare coined the term um, to see something in your mind's eye in Hamlet when, uh, when Hamlet saw the ghost of his father and didn't know if it was a figment of his imagination or an actual ghost. And he said, All right, you know, I see my father in my mind's eye. So how do you get an image out of your mind's eye and into someone else's? is the foundation of all the work that I do in my teaching, my training, and my coaching. Were you a good artist? No, not at all. So that doesn't, I, that doesn't even matter? No, this was literally stick figures. And let me see if I have a, a little, little show and tell you. I can actually show you. Here's a, uh, for our viewing audience at home, here's the, uh, do I have it? Yeah, so you don't, you don't have here's to. The, here's the sketch. Here's the actual. That's actually pretty good. The rendering. Yeah, not too bad for someone who can't draw. I right? don't think I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but that's how I did it. Was, uh, you know, it was stick figures and arrows combined with, uh, it got a little better over time. But yeah, you don't, I just wrote my first article for Inc. Magazine. I'm not sure if you saw it. It's called, Can You Draw What Your Company Does? It was just published two weeks ago. And it talks about an exercise I do with my clients to have them literally get up at flip charts and draw what they do, how they do it. And through doing that, through little drawings and metaphors, um, can you explain an idea to a customer, a client, a stakeholder? Um, Is there a different part of the brain, different part of consciousness that that opens up? We're not used to doing it? Yeah, we talk about left brain and right brain metaphorically, where left, I always remember left brain logical. So that's the side with like math and words. And then right brain rhythm is the side with music and art and creativity. We leverage the right brain when we draw, when we when we pick up a pen and it's it's uh, or use slides or imagery, um, and it's called uh, there's two scientific principles at play here without getting into all the the details. One is picture superiority effect, which says that when words and pictures are doing battle against each other, pictures win. It's just the way our brains are wired. And dual coding theory says that when you imprint memory um, information both through text and images, it's much more effective than either one on its own. So, because again, it accesses both sides of the brain. Um, and that's it. That's basically in a nutshell why visual imagery and visual language as well. It's not just pictures, it's actual visual language. So when we tell stories or use metaphors, we're triggering that side of the brain as well. Yeah, we know this too, right? When you look at some sort of marketing collateral or website, and if you were just to split out just the content in the black and white and read that separately, you would have a much different feel 
and a much different emotional reaction yeah. to it. Yeah. Uh, Picture well, how, a, like a newspaper or magazine ad with all the text versus a billboard on the highway, right? right. It's a different medium. You, you, a billboard on the highway, just like with a PowerPoint slide, you need to be able to communicate in the blink of an eye or while driving 80 miles an hour down the highway, right? You couldn't put like a whole slot, billboard of text, right? So we need to think about what's our medium, what's our message. That's going back to Marshall McLuhan stuff, right? Um, how do we trans communicate in the best way possible for our audience and our purpose, right? We need to think about who mm. are we trying to reach and what's going to resonate with them. And that comes up a lot with metaphors and examples and stories. Are we telling stories using examples and using metaphors that will resonate with our particular audience? So often they resonate with us, but we need to put ourselves in the shoes of others, what I call flipping the eye and seeing things from someone else's perspective. Yeah, it makes me think about, you know, some of the parables from ancient texts um, that were so effective in communicating messages. Yeah, Aesop's fables, uh, Confucius stories, right? Sure. They're all very visual. Yeah. And we spend so much time analyzing every last word, trying to get the perfect sentence, the perfect structure, the magical combination of phrases, yeah. when really it's, we're only activating that one part and the other part is left untouched. Yeah. Uh, when did you f first see the business application? Uh, so you, uh, you were there, you, with folks that didn't understand the language, you drew pictures, they kind of got where you were coming from. When did that then morph into leadership and kind of leadership development and training? Yeah, I mean, well, one is going through trainings myself, how horrible the PowerPoint slides were, how, uh, how awful the visual aids were, because they tended to be, you, know, you go to a training and they hand you a 500 page manual of printed text, who's reading that? You know, so often, in fact, people left them on the tables. They were so <laughs> heavy and so that people would thumb through it. I'm like, I'm never gonna look at this. Why am I lugging this on the plane, right? I'm gonna have to pay an extra hundred dollars in, in, in luggage fees, you know, for this. Um, you give someone a sheet of paper with an image on it or a couple of, or a diagram. Um, like here's an example, here's my visual bio. This is my, I keep this in front of your bio. Think of, so this is my entire career <laughs> from start to finish in a, in a linear, so every image, every icon will trigger a story. So I have this in front of me as you were asking about my career, I could pick any one of these and say, tell me a story about when you were at Disney. Tell me a story when you were, were at Dale Carnegie training, right? It's the visual icons that just trigger that the memories that just come flooding back. Wordsworth had a poem, um, The Daffodils. And he talked about how when he was lying on his couch, he would picture the daffodils in his mind um, and his heart would race with elation as if he was seeing them for the first time, right? So think about that. Think about what are some of the visual images in your head that trigger thoughts, feelings, and how do you communicate those to someone else to inspire them is, a, is one of the foundations of what visual leadership is all about and how it works. Help me understand um, a bit of the, the how-to here. I'm a business leader. I can just use words, but use them in a way that creates an imagery, a, a, a view for someone, put someone in that emotional mm -hmm. space. And I could actually also use physical pictures yeah. as well. What are your thoughts on between those two ways of getting- Yes, never either or, it's usually both. Just as I said with dual coding theory. So like, let's say you, you hire a new person and you're trying to train them, right? You can say, do these 10 things, don't do these 10 things. Or you could tell them a story about, let me tell you about when I first started here and I had your job, let me tell you about the worst mistake I ever made. Do you think that person's ever gonna forget that story and the lessons in it? And the, so you're, you're almost creating a movie. And again, coming out of the TV and entertainment industry, I think very much visually and in the theme park business, if you think about it, you can go to, let's say you go to Universal or Disney to go on this ride, right? The ride is two minutes or three minutes, but when does your experience start? As soon as you drive through those gates that say the happiest place on earth and you park in the Mickey Mouse section or whatever, right? So it's like, as an instructor, I try to create that experience um, for my students and for my clients that is not just about the facts, but it's about the, what do you want people to think, feel, know, and do as a result of your interacting with them, right? So it's not just, um, you know, here's, here's a, like just overloading people with information. It literally is about how do you change someone's mindset? Um, I was just telling someone this quote from Bernard Baruch saying, he said, the ability to express an idea is as important as the idea itself. Sure. So you can have an amazing idea, but you yeah. can't express it so it resonates with the other person. And there's no one size fits all way to do that, right? I mean, you really need to adapt it to our listeners. Like right now we're talking to the conscious capitalism audience. Like what matters to people, what resonates to this audience, that's where we want to focus our attention. Yeah, we talk about belonging, purpose, meaning, inclusion. Yeah, um, social engagement. Um, um, you know, we got, we got to draw, we got to draw stories around it. Yeah, exactly. And then feeling states. I, I always love the quote from uh, Maya Angelou. It says, 
you will never remember what someone said, but you will remember how they made you feel. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's so true. <laughs> we always have that. Um, you, so you mentioned as an instructor for college and everything. So you bring these principles to your students, undergrads, how are they using it and applying it to their current you know, undergrad and, and job searching experience? Yeah, they love it because first of all, it's different, right? So just in, in terms of the human brain craves variety, right? So so many instructors are still teaching with the old style lecture and textbook method that they grew up with, right? So if you engage students, my, my class literally starts with a game show kind of quiz. Like put your, you know, I, I, they walk in, before I go over the syllabus, before I even introduce myself, I say, put your books away, close your laptops, you're having a pop quiz, this counts for 50% of your final grade. And they're like, wait, what? Well, we, just, we just sat down. And then I show them a series of uh, leadership quotes where certain words are left out and they have to fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. They have to do it first on their own, then with a partner, and then they have to share. And I reveal the answers through a visual slideshow. In fact, here's my, uh... so if they get the answer right, if they get it wrong, <laughs> right? So what, what, so you imagine walking to a class where that's what you experience within the first seven minutes, right? It says, this is not gonna be your, you know, your father's leadership training, right? You're activating all the senses. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So this, that sets the tone, like this is gonna be different and they're hooked from, you know, for the next 14 weeks. <laughs> that's fantastic. One uh, thing I wanna say, a lot of professors, I do a lot of training of other instructors at NYU, a lot of them say, oh, the first four to six sessions of my course are lecture and then we shift to the interactivity. Yeah. It's too late. You've lost them. I had a professor once who opened by saying the, the first half hour of this is going to be a little boring, but it gets more interesting <laughs> later. It's like, no, make it interesting now. You know, it's like, that's not an excuse for anything. Whether you're pitching a client, imagine walking to a client and saying, this is going to be really boring for the first 15 minutes, but bear with me. It's like, no, we're not going to bear with you. Make it interesting. We rarely finish the book or the movie. Yeah. That doesn't <laughs> capture our attention right, right yeah. away. So we know how this is in, in, in real life. For the conscious capitalism audience, I think a lot of our um, members and, and fans are thinking about the younger generation. And they, they're probably reading, and we all are about the stats, that the younger generation is a lot more based on social impact, a lot more altruistic, yeah. want to make a difference. What are you noticing from the kids at NYU and Columbia in terms of the impact they want to make? Yeah, what we're teaching, when we're talking, you can't just talk about case studies of IBM in 1975, right? You need to be talking about what's going out on the streets now. Right. The so social engagement issues, uh, the pandemic, um, income inequality, like these are, that's what they care about. So um, diversity, inclusion, belonging, equity. You need to weave those things. You don't say, oh, that's our module eight. We'll get to that later. No, it's gotta be part of woven into the fabric of your conversation right now. So one way I do that is I have my, very few students are reading the physical copy of the New York Times. So, but you know, go on, where are you getting your news? So some of the instructors say to the students, put your digital devices away so you can focus. I say, take them out so we could use them, right? Cause that's real life. So I'll say, look, when I, like with the leadership quotes exercise, you have a two minute scavenger hunt, find a, a quote on leadership that resonates with you and share it with us, type it in the chat box, right? Same thing, find something in the news, what's going on that was on last night's news or right now, wherever you get your news, Twitter, Facebook, whatever your source is, what's going on right now that ties into this topic we're talking about today, teams, leadership, um, you know, diversity, whatever it is. And then that makes it real, that brings it to life. So it's not academic, hypothetical, or theoretical, this is real stuff. And I always say, we wanna bring the real world into the classroom, process it, play around with it, explore it, and then take what we learned out into the real world. And the next session, we'll, we'll talk about what you saw between last week and this week, right? That's how you make it real. That's how students get engaged. And then we say, what are you gonna do about it, right? It's not just, all right, this is what I learned. So I always talk about insights, actions, and outcomes. What did you learn? What are you gonna do? And what will the result be if you do what you said you're gonna do? And that's how you bring, that's how you create change. Yeah, this is brilliant. And you know, I'm t I'm, I had the recording of this. I want to watch <laughs> it back myself because I teach classes. And this is just such, it's such profound and simple, but also um, very profound and impactful information. So I'm going to lead in with this because I think you can create a whole career, honestly, taught of just training the trainers. because It's such an important element, professors, facilitators, coaches of all kinds. Um, but I'll let you answer. What do you have in store for 2021 and beyond? What's next for you? Yeah, I do. I actually do do Train the Trainer. My brother and I did a five-part series of Train the Trainer programs for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security to train their 
um, their agents in their immigration and, uh, and refugee areas. So and I've trained other clients as well. And I do faculty engagement. So I love one of the reasons I talk so fast is I've, I've, you know, I was talking about passion and purpose, the two mm -hmm. P's. You can tell I'm very passionate about what I do because we've all sat in horrible trainings, horrible courses, had horrible bosses, bad professors, right? It's like, I want to be the type of professor and boss that other people talk about and say, this is who I learned from. This is who inspired me, just as I had certain people who inspired me throughout my career. So next level is just to keep spreading the word on visual leadership and getting people to see the world through a new lens um, and basically change the world by looking at the world through the lens of people who are different from them and helping other people. You know, being a leader, one aspect is formulating a vision of the future in your mind's eye. Another aspect is communicating it in a clear and compelling way that inspire others. But another way is how do you, are you helping other people realize their visions and make their visions a reality? And that's where we can pay it forward and help other people to do that. So one thing I'm gonna be doing is creating a series of masterclasses based on my book, where each chapter is three to five pages. Each chapter could be its own 45 minute to an hour uh, session on how do you use these tools, tips and techniques to be a more visual leader. So that's my main focus. So uh, we were talking about that before. 2020 is like a write off financially. So it's like, it's all about building my brand, promoting my book, getting the word out there, laying the foundation for hopefully 2021 being a, a better year for all of us. Yeah, it's a long rainy weekend as we talked about before. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm here, I mean, I hear so many things in there. I hear EQ, I hear empathy, I hear understanding. Um, we could do a whole conversation on all yeah. those topics individually. But uh, Bob Todd, thank you so much for sharing. This is, I think it's really profound insight, uh, something we could all benefit more from, whether we're running our own business, whether we're running a team, whether we're teaching, facilitating coaching. This is really powerful stuff. So really thank you. And I hope people go out and attend your master classes and buy your book. And uh, I think we can gain a lot from it. I'm certainly thank a fan and I'll be on board. Um, so Todd, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Joe. This was yeah, great. thank you. Uh, before we let you go, just real quick, where can we learn more about you and get your book? Yeah, so I live on LinkedIn, so connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Todd Churches there, so uh, follow That's me good. there. I'm always trying to promote visual leadership concepts there and curate, etc. cetera. Um, my new website just launched a few weeks ago, toddchurches.com. And if you go to toddchurches.com slash subscribe, you can download my list of top 52 visual leadership books to help you be a more visual leader. And my book's available wherever books are sold, including Amazon. Wonderful. All right, well, thanks again, Todd. And uh, I also want to thank our New York City Conscious Capitalism chapter sponsors, the Core Club and the Tomiak Foundation. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us for the latest episode of Conscious Business Connections and hope to see you again soon.